pre-election bombshell. The campaigns respond to the latest Clinton email investigation. Effect on the election, how polls are changing in these days leading up to the presidential vote. Italy earthquake. The tremor turns a historic basilica into rubble. And papal trip to Sweden. Pope Francis is in the midst of an ecumenical mission. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Monday, October 31st, 2016. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick. Hillary Clinton challenges the new FBI investigation into her email, saying there's no case here. She accuses the FBI of interfering with politics days before the election. Our chief White House correspondent and political director Lauren Ashburn reports. This is the single biggest scandal since Watergate. Donald Trump this weekend fans the flames of controversy over Hillary Clinton's private email server. The Justice Department secured a warrant to start searching a computer believed to contain emails of top Clinton aide Huma Abedin. The computer was seized as part of an investigation into sexting allegations against Abedin's estranged husband, Anthony Weiner. Law enforcement officials say the FBI stumbled on the emails weeks ago, but Director James Comey didn't disclose the discovery until Friday after a series of meetings inside the FBI. The timing, just days before the election, is raising questions about Comey's decision to inform Congress about reviewing the emails. On Sunday, Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid said that Comey may have violated the Hatch Act, which bars political activity by federal officials. Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta criticizes Comey's decision. To throw this in the middle of the campaign, uh, 11 days out, <clears throat> just seem to break with precedent and, and be inappropriate this stage. If they're not significant, they're not significant. Clinton herself is expressing concern. It's not just strange, it's unprecedented, and it is deeply troubling. Lauren Ashburn, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Lauren. And what does this bombshell announcement mean for the election a week from tomorrow? Jason Calvey continues our team coverage from FBI headquarters here in Washington. Jason? Brian, polls show Clinton's lead shrinking this past week. The latest ABC News Washington Post poll, poll puts Clinton ahead of Trump by just one point. The survey was conducted last Wednesday through Saturday, a day after the latest bombshell. The Comey letter uh, is likely to have a very major impact on the election. Uh, it was the most remarkable thing that any of us has ever seen. Veteran political commentator Cokie Roberts says she can no longer predict who will win the presidential election. Earlier, she thought Clinton would. The White House press secretary says he won't defend or criticize the FBI director. The president is completely confident that Director Comey has not taken any steps to try to intentionally influence the outcome of the election or to advantage one candidate or one political party. But the top Democrat on the House Oversight Committee blasts Comey. That basically gave uh, Donald Trump a softball to hit over uh, the fence. Donald Trump and Governor Mike Pence praised the FBI director's Friday surprise, new Clinton-related emails. And it took guts for Director Comey to make the move that he made in light of the kind of opposition he had where they're trying to protect her from criminal prosecution. We want to commend the FBI for reopening this case for one simple principle, and that is no one is above the law. Roberts says this may not end on Election Day. This will be debated for many years to come. This is not something that is part of the American tradition to have essentially the head of the national investigative police force put a thumb on the scale so close to an election. The chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee, Republican Chuck Grassley, says the American people and Congress deserve more information from the FBI. Brian, you may remember that the FBI director closed the Clinton email case this summer. He said at the time that Clinton was extremely careless but he stopped short of recommending charges against her. What an interesting development. Jason Calvey, thank you. Billionaire investor and tech titan Peter Thiel defends his support of Donald Trump. 
The PayPal co-founder says Trump gets the big things right and will get the economy back on track. Wyatt Goolsby reports tonight from Capitol Hill. Wyatt. Brian Peter Thiel says he's all in for Trump, a position you're not likely to hear in Silicon Valley, where his peers lean left and overwhelmingly support Hillary Clinton. But Thiel made, laid out his case for the Republican nominee while visiting Washington, D.C. today. No matter what happens in this election, what Trump represents isn't crazy and it's not going away. PayPal co-founder and Facebook investor Peter Thiel says Donald Trump is not the perfect candidate, but he says the American people need a Washington outsider at the helm. Trump's agenda is about making America a normal country. A normal country doesn't have a half trillion dollar trade deficit. A normal country doesn't fight five simultaneous undeclared wars. In a normal country, the government actually does its job. Thiel has stunned Silicon Valley by pledging to donate more than a million dollars to the Trump campaign and super PACs. Yes, I would. Right. Yes, I would. That, that act, but what about the one the FCC is about to? I would, I would vote for net neutrality. The vast majority of tech giants in Silicon Valley support Hillary Clinton, but Thiel disagrees with his peers. What we have is a debate between, you know, one candidate who says everything's more or less fine or it's as good as it can be, and then uh, another one who says, uh, you know, that we're on the Titanic, it's about to sink. And so I, I prefer the second one. Thiel says he faces lots of criticism from his neighbors for his outspoken support for Trump. The billionaire entrepreneur says he respects their choice, but he hopes voters will look carefully at each candidate's agenda. Peter Thiel says that his company, nor, no, neither his company nor his investments have lost out any business that he can tell as a result of backing Trump. Now, he has backed Republicans before. In the past two Republican primaries, he backed Ron Paul, and then the latest primary, he backed Carly Fiorina. Brian? Wyatt Goolsby, thank you. Join us next Tuesday for live election coverage at 6 and 9 p.m. Eastern Time, right here on EWTN. Our News Nightly team reports from the Clinton and Trump campaigns in New York City, and from the White House and Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Italy pledges to find housing for those displaced by a series of powerful earthquakes, leaving more than 15,000 people in need of help. Mary Shovlin reports. Sunday morning's quake with a magnitude of 6.6 .6 caused no deaths or serious injuries, but it complicated relief efforts in an area still coping with the aftermath of a deadly earthquake in August. Many of the towns struck are of historic significance. In Norcia, the 14th century Basilica of St. Benedict, built on the traditional birthplace of St. Benedict, founder of the Benedictine order, was destroyed. City Hall was also struck. Adesso in programma è un'azione di salvare tutto il patrimonio che è rimasto in piedi. This firefighter says his priority now is to save what is left. The quake shook Rome about 70 miles southwest of the epicenter, waking residents. Esprimo la mia vicinanza alle popolazioni dell'Italia centrale. The Holy Father expressed his support at his Sunday Angelus. Now the rebuilding begins after the strongest earthquake to strike the country since 1980. Mary is with us tonight. Mary, describe the aftershocks you felt there in Rome. That's right, it was about 7.40 a.m. in the morning here in Italy, and I was already awake at the time, uh, as most people were getting out and about, going to Sunday Mass. And now all of a sudden, uh, the ground began to shake, and we're used to aftershocks here. but. This was the strongest earthquake to hit Italy since 1980. So while we thought we were just having aftershocks, it turned out to be a very major quake, registering up to 6.6 .6 on the Richter scale, uh, causing a lot of damage, of course, locally, even some cracks in some of the buildings here in Rome. And how are the recovery efforts going there today? Italy's Prime Minister Matteo Renzi is promising to help the some 15,000 plus who have been displaced by this latest earthquake. Uh, thousands have been displaced, of course, since August and the latest round uh, of earthquakes. Many more thousands have been displaced. And the problem is, yes, they may, or, they may be hotels enough to welcome them. Many don't want to leave, however. Some have livestock in the region. Some think the hotels to where they're going wouldn't be safe as well. So there's fear that where they're going might not be safe for them either. So some are choosing to sleep in their cars. Others uh, taking up lodging with friends in nearby villages or even as far south here 
in Rome. But the prime minister has vowed to help them. They can't sleep in tents. The mountain uh, areas are hitting near freezing temperatures now that winter is setting in. But the Italian government has promised that help is on the way. Mary Shovlin in Rome and Pope Francis visits Sweden. He's joining Lutherans for the start of a year-long commemoration leading up to the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's Reformation. Pope Francis tells journalists aboard the papal plane that he hopes to promote cooperation and understanding among religions. The Pope joined Lutheran leaders for a joint service in Lund Cathedral taking turns offering prayers. Francis, speaking in Spanish, says we have the opportunity to move beyond controversy and disagreement. He also says, quote, we must look with love and honesty at our past, recognizing error and seeking forgiveness. And applause as a joint statement is signed pledging to improve relations between Catholics and Lutherans. The leaders promise to work together to heal conflicts, welcome refugees, and care for the planet. They say the event is not really a celebration of Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation. It is a solemn commemoration to ask forgiveness for the schism in Western Christianity and rejoice in recent improved relations. Sweden's Prime Minister greeted Pope Francis at the airport. Stefan Löfven praises the cooperation between Catholics and Lutherans and the Pope's support for refugees. That is good uh, that the Pope has been very clear about the necessity of us helping people that are in need, uh, that needs help. So I think that is uh, very important that the Pope is so clear. And the crowds cheer Pope Francis during his Swedish visit. The royal family. King Carl XVI Gustav and Queen Sylvia join the Holy Father for the ecumenical prayer service. Tomorrow, the Pope celebrates Mass for the Solemnity of All Saints with Swedish Catholics. Coming up, coalition troops creep closer to the ISIS stronghold of Mosul. And the Supreme Court agrees to hear a critical gender case. Thank you for joining us for EWTN News Nightly on this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick. Iraqi special forces advance on Mosul from the east, taking heavy fire from Islamic State fighters. The advancing troops are now within two miles of the city's eastern limits. The dawn assault saw armored vehicles move on the village of Bazwaya. Artillery and uh, airstrikes hit ISIS positions from allied guns, drawing mortar and small arms fire from ISIS. Advances have been slower in the south, with government forces still about 20 miles outside the city. It took 30 years, but strong-willed Christian leader Michel Aoun is Lebanon's new elected president. The 81-year-old politician was voted in today by a majority in parliament. Many consider him Lebanon's strongest Christian leader, supported by Christians and Shiite Muslims alike. The former army commander led his forces through some of the deadliest battles of Lebanon's civil war. He served briefly as prime minister, but in 1990 was forced into exile in France for 14 years. He now returns triumphantly to the presidential palace. A Vatican envoy helps me mediate talks between Venezuela's opposition and the government there. The talks come as the opposition steps up its campaign to force President Nicolas Maduro from office. Maduro met last week with Pope Francis at the Vatican. Both sides agree to tone down the heated rhetoric of the past few days, focusing instead on topics ranging from human rights to the economy. Archbishop Claudio Maria Celli, along with the former presidents of Spain, Panama, and the Dominican Republic, joined President Maduro in the opening those talks in Caracas. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear the appeal of a Virginia school board. It wants to prevent a transgender student from using the boys' restroom. This will be the first time the court rules on transgender rights. Roger Severino, director of the DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. Roger, do you think that the court will address this broad issue, or will this be more of a narrow ruling in this particular case? Well, it remains to be seen. Either way, the issue of whether or not a biological female can go into the boys' bathroom will be decided. And there's two possibilities. Either the court is going to say that the government overreached, that the government cannot issue legislation through letters, which is what it did in this case, and the lower court has to re-decide the issue. Or it could decide the issue on the marriage outright. And this is really important because they already redefined marriage last year. They may redefine what it means to be a man and a woman. Now, the fact that the court is down to eight justices, how might that impact this hearing in this case? 
It's interesting because we had five members of the court already issued a stay on the case in the lower court. So right now the status quo remains. You have men's and women's rooms, boys and women's bathrooms. Now the question is, are you going to get those same five to uphold that same stay and say, yes, it is logical that when Congress banned sex discrimination in 1972, they meant biological sex, not something else. You might have five votes for that. So if the ruling goes in that direction. Would that affect these cases that are still in lower courts? It will indeed. Already you have a Texas court that issued a nationwide ban against the administration enforcing its guidance. So already we have 24 states that sued. One court is already saying no to the Obama administration, saying it's overreach, and you have the Supreme Court issuing a stay. So this really should freeze things until the Supreme Court decides, probably at the end of next year. Well, the executive branch has certainly taken its stand, and now we're looking at the judicial branch. What about the legislative branch? Does Congress have any authority? Do you expect any action from Congress on this issue? Congress definitely has a role, and that's really the issue at point. Did Congress mean what it said when it banned sex discrimination, or is the new gender, gender ideology going to take over? Congress could reassort its authority and pass something like the Civil Rights Uniformity Act, which says that sex, for purposes of anti-discrimination law, does not mean gender identity. And that is consistent with what our laws were meant to be and consistent in our best traditions. Well, what would it take to clarify that, to make that crystal clear that we can't go off on this gender identity tangent? Well, a court could simply step in and say that's not what Congress meant. So hopefully the Supreme Court will say that and take the issue, take it off the table, and put it back in the hands of the local school districts and states. And local school districts have been addressing the question with sensitivity. They provide accommodations for kids with gender identity issues, as the court did here, as the school court, school, the school did here in this case. And hopefully the court will say, yes, the states should have the freedom to continue to accommodate people, and this way you have a solution where nobody loses. We will watch this case very closely, and I know you'll help us out with it. Roger Severino, the Heritage Foundation, thank you. Thank you very much. Up next, the future of capital punishment, where voters could decide to abolish the death penalty. And states move to relax restrictions on abortion clinics. Thanks for joining us this Monday evening. I'm Brian Patrick, and capital punishment is already banned in 19 states. Now voters in three more states will decide whether or not to keep or lose the death penalty. Daniel Flynn of the Catholic Mobilizing Network is joining us. So Nebraska's debate over this is very heated. What about these other states? Yeah, so we actually have three states right now where the death penalty will be on the ballot uh, on Election Day. And uh, you mentioned Nebraska already, so Nebraskans are going to vote whether or not actually to bring back the death penalty. So. Um, the vote that the Catholic Church is certainly seeking is a vote of retain, which would uphold the Nebraska legislature's repeal of the death penalty last May. And then in California, we have dueling referendums. One, Proposition 62, which would end the death penalty, replacing it with life without parole. Proposition 66, which would speed up the death penalty by cutting appeals. And so the church is How certainly... Odd. Yeah, the church is really... Um, has been vocally calling for a yes on 62, no on 66. And then third, we have Oklahoma, which is trying to enshrine the death penalty in its state constitution. And so the church has been very vocal in opposing or a vote of, calling for a vote of no on state question 776. So you're saying the church supports this, and, but doesn't the church teach that not necessarily the death penalty is wrong? No, you are right. So the, 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 the Catholic catechism of the church does um, does say that the state has the right to impose the death penalty, um, but, but there are very specific circumstances where that's, where that's necessary. And the Catechism states, if non-lethal means are available to defend public safety, then those are what we should use, as those are more in line with the common good and with the dignity of the human person. And John Paul II, and St. John Paul II in Evangelium Vitae said, you know, that these cases where the death penalty is warranted in modern society with our penological advances are rare, if not practically non-existent. And since then, Pope Francis has called for the end <clears throat> of the death penalty, many bishops joining him. A recent uh, Pew research, though, shows that Catholics are very divided on this. Yeah, so I mean, the Pew research is exciting because the, the American public has the lowest support of capital punishment in over four decades, only 49%. And Catholics actually support the death penalty at even lower rates. Only 43% of Catholics support the death penalty. But it's close, 46% of Catholics uh, oppose the death penalty, 43% support it. And, you know, I, I think that um, 
when you're talking about the death penalty, we're talking about horrible crimes and people want justice to be served. And I think that there's unfortunately this false sense that the death penalty brings justice. But the catechism is clear that if non-lethal means are available, those are what we should use. And I think that as people are understanding more of the other problems that we have with capital punishment, 156 people who have been exonerated or proven innocent from death row, um, it costs more than life without parole. It's disproportionately used on racial minorities and, and people who are living in poverty. Um, I, I think that, you know, as, as the Catholic Church continues to raise its voice on these issues, we're going to see Catholics continue to oppose the death penalty at even higher percentages. So uh, th how does this tie in with the issue of life? I mean, we're pro-life. We are a pro-life church, and the death penalty is an important piece of our, of our fabric. Uh, of our of our consistent ethic of life nature and you know one thing I would point to is um, the, the Texas bishops uh, on October 10th of this month which is World Day Against the Death Penalty issued a, a, a profound and prophetic statement uh, calling for the end of the death penalty in their state and one of the phrases they use is that the death penalty is undeniably a pro-life issue. Daniel Flynn of the Catholic Mobilizing Network. Thank you Daniel. Thanks so much Brian. Appreciate it. Susan B. Anthony List works to get out the vote. The national pro-life group says 700 activists fanned out across four battleground states in support of pro-life candidates. They knocked on the doors of a million homes in Florida, North Carolina, Ohio, and Missouri. The Virginia Board of Health wants to weaken state regulations requiring abortion clinics to meet the same standards as some hospitals. The Board of Health voted to remove these requirements, that abortion clinics meet Centers for Disease Control minimum for preventing infection, that women be offered post-abortive counseling, and that clinics have transfer agreements with local hospitals in the event of an emergency. Joining us by Skype from Richmond, Victoria Cobb, the president of the Family Foundation. Victoria, if these amendments are adopted, will there be any restrictions at all on abortion clinics in Virginia? Well, unfortunately, the Board of Health voted to roll back over 20 key health and safety standards, um, probably the most astonishing of which was actually infection control. We had the minimum standards by the CDC, and now we have no standards. Um, and that's just one among many. They actually voted simply to allow the commissioner to have unlimited, unfettered authority to essentially waive any standard she wants to for any clinic for any reason. So it's incredibly disappointing. There will still be standards. It's simply a matter of does the commissioner actually choose to enforce them under the uh, McAuliffe administration? How has the McAuliffe administration pushed this through? Well, in Virginia, your governor does have a lot of appointment authority, and so he has litmus tested the Board of Health members. Each one that he has brought on has not only been a supporter of abortion rights, but has actually been engaged almost in the abortion industry. Former Planned Parenthood board members, a doctor who has a has a uh, office at Planned Parenthood, he has simply constructed the board that he wanted to do uh, the rollback that he was looking for. So if these rules are rolled back, what is the next step? Well, we have a few hoops that procedurally still need to happen. There's a, a sign-off from the governor's office and the attorney general's office. There is a 30-day public comment period, but essentially these will go into effect very shortly. Uh, however, in that process and in the haste that the governor's office showed to pass these standards, we actually believe they broke state law several times in following the administrative uh, act that they were supposed to follow, the, the process that they were supposed to follow. And so we are actually looking into and considering litigation or, or an administrative appeal against the state um, to block these regulations from going into effect because they were passed illegally in our eyes. Is there any other pro-life response to this? Is there anything we can do? Well, certainly, we need to continue to express our outrage in that upcoming public comment period. We need to be uh, very vigilant to, uh, you know, make those comments, tell our friends and neighbors about what is happening. And, of course, we need to be mindful that there are elections, and elections have consequences. And when we elect our governors and our presidents and people that have appointment power of this nature, we need to be very careful what they believe and who they're going to appoint. All right, Family Foundation President Victoria Cobb Skyping with us from Richmond, Virginia. Thank you, Victoria. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us tonight. For the EWTN News Nightly Team, I'm Brian Patrick. Good night. God bless you.